Good morning and assalamu alaikum everyone. Today's journal topic, journal club topic for today is in continuation to what we have gone through in the past one month and it's about RCC, its treatment and diagnosis. Today's topic would be minimally invasive alternatives. I am Dr. Muhammad Zafar Ahmed and today's moderator for presentation will be Dr. Bilal Masood. So a little recap about how things have gone so far. So in the last three decades, there has been an increased incidence of RCC. Henceforth, it's worthy to mention the, the new noble diagnostic techniques that have been sold so far, like the introduction of CAT scans, MRIs, and ultrasounds. Despite this, there has been an increase in the five-year survival rate which has actually gone up from 50% to 74%. Henceforth, an early diagnosis of small renal masses, especially the T1 stage diseases, has led to the evolution of new approaches. The introduction of minimally invasive techniques and the increased frequency of utilization of such techniques like laparoscopic assisted and robotic assisted techniques for treatment of RCC with respect to performing partial nephrectomies and radical nephrectomies is well known today. So it's very fair to say that the urologist armamentarium is not just limited to open surgery like in the early 20th century. It now includes cryoablation, radiofrequency ablation, angiomobilization, SPLRS or uh, we can uh, or notes and uh, laparoscopic assisted or single port laparoscopic retroperitoneal surgeries or natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgeries to be known today. It's imperative to note that nephron sparing surgeries like partial nephrectomy is linked with a decreased risk of cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, a lower risk of morbidity and mortality to the patient. So here's how so far things have shaped up for renal surgery with regards to renal cell, can cell cancer. Uh, it started way off with the radical nephrectomy which was the hallmark organ sparing surgery. And then we moved on and proceeded with partial nephrectomy while Clayman in 1991 performed the first laparoscopic assisted radical nephrectomy and that itself was a true seismic event in urology, which was shortly followed by cryoablation in the early 2000s in RFA. Active surveillance joined in later with the introduction of robotic surgery in the field of urology, broadened the horizons further. As I said earlier, SPLRS or notes or uh, single port laparoscopic surgery and natural RFA trans endoscopic luminal surgery as it's better known today has decreased the invasiveness of the procedures. So, moving on to the first procedure that is more widely accepted and usually practiced nowadays with respect to treatment of RCC across the world. Radiofrequency ablation is limited to small renal masses which staged up to at least T1B. It should not be less than four centimeters but at least more than a centimeter from PUJ and are at least one centimeter from segmental renal vessels without abutting the pilocalicinal system. Why is it that why is this that important? Well I'll come that I'll come to this in the upcoming slides why segmental renal vessels uh, are important while ablating a tumor radio by radio frequency. Well, it works on the principle of monopolar alternating current. It actually goes on to heat up the, the tumor substance to a degree of 100 degree, Fahrenheit, degree centigrade, which is the boiling point of the water, causes, causes ionic agitation, causes occlusion of microvasculature, leads and results in the tissue damage via cell membrane lysis, resulting in DNA damage, and obviously and causing a predictable zone of coagulate and necrosis. A temperature, a sustained temperature to be precise, of more than 50 degrees centigrade 
for a period of four to six minutes is the goal to be achieved. So what happens if the temperature goes beyond the set temperature? So if the temperature of the tissue goes beyond 105 degrees centigrade, it results in the vaporization of tissue, which leads to gas formation and hence creates an inefficient RF lesion, which does not produce good results with regards to radio frequency ablation of the tumor. It is usually performed in an outpatient sitting Well, uh, the, the instruments that are used or the probes that are used to ablate a tumor by radio frequency have multiple, have multiple approaches. Say for example, you can use a single probe on an electrode versus a multi-tined one. Wet probes have been used moderately. What they do is they actually instill a poorly resistive fluid which causes premature, which actually in fact co uh, prevents the premature charring and obviously goes on to decrease the impedance, hence making an efficient radio frequency ablative zone within the tumor. The feedback loops, well obviously when you're actually ablating a tumor, you need some sort of a feedback which ensures that you do not ablate or damage native renal tissue. Hence we have an impedance bound feedback loop or a temperature bound feedback loop. Uh, it's important to note that exophytic tumors are surrounded by perirenal fats and they are better treated than central tumors in which vascular structures actually act as a heat sink. What this means is that a computer controlled generator provides energy to the probe on the basis of either the average temperature achieved or major impedance of the tissue or resistance in other words which is monitored during ablation. Impedance rises towards infinity when tissues are desiccated during ablation or when there is charring, hence the need of feedback loops. Here is a multi-tined radio frequency probe and here very well demonstrated is a single time probe which is placed with the CT guided image. So coming to excess, so there have been numerous articles which advocate the use of percutaneous or transcutaneous excess to the tumor versus a laparoscopic assisted. As far as percutaneous access is concerned, it is reserved only for posterior or laterally located tumors, while laparoscopic access is reserved only for anteriorly placed tumors. General contraindications for laparoscopic surgery also imply here, which include abdominal contraindications to abdominal insufflation, which might be due to secondary pulmonary or cardiac compromise. There have been debates of using general anesthesia versus sedation. It's well known that general anesthesia causes a sustained respiratory movement, makes the sta kidney stationary and hence expedites the tumor targeting. So how to, how to go about the planning of a procedure of such nature? and the technical consideration that actually go into it. So there are two distinct categories for tumors which can be ablated by radio frequency. One being solid tumors which measure no less than 3 cm and no more than 4 cm. Patient present to you with normal GFR, hence a wide ablated mar ablation margin is required. With hereditary syndromes such as von hippel lindau syndrome recurrent clear cell renal neoplasms, there is an increased risk of recurrence, hence, hence the need for aggressive margins. Because the risk of local recurrence is high, wide ablative margin is required in such cases. 24 hours creatinine clearance pre and post procedure, 
helps to evaluate the patient pre and post procedure differentiating between any renal insult caused post procedure prior imaging helps in optimal electrode path and obviously recognize the recognition of probe and tumor relationship with respect to vital organs is established as well because genitofemoral and ileoinguinal nerves are re passed through the same passage have a same course through which the probes are placed groin paresthesia is a common complication post procedure hypertensive crisis in case of ablation margin extending way beyond the tumor itself and affecting the renal ipsilateral adrenal gland is a common complication but needs to be addressed by an experienced anesthesiologist or a urologist per operatively for patients who have actually gone and or have underwent abdominal surgeries in the past present further challenge in placement of the probe with relation to the already existing intra abdominal adhesions so as far as the imaging goes it's important to know what you kill and it's important to recognize the path of the probe and the the extent of the tumor that you are going to ablate so the propensity for cystic elements within the tumor and leads to further complexity for probe selection and placement say for example in dealing bosnia class 3 and 4 lesions probe must be moved multiple times to ablate the solid component as far as the exophytic lesions are concerned they are readily ablated owing to the oven effect while the medullary tumors do not ablate that well because of the heat sink effect why is that so exophytic tumors are actually surrounded by perirenal fat after the after initiation initiation of radio frequency ablation this the required temperatures are reached the fat actually goes on to insulate and contain and sustain the temperature causing an oven or a baking effect while medullary cortical or cortical tumors are situated near vascular or segmental arteries within the renal tissue or near the pilocalicel system where the urine ec- collects leads to dissipation of heat hence an effective temperature which is need for thermally ablating post radio frequency ablation is not reached hence the inefficiency of the procedure hydro dissection with 5% dextrose water under a ct or ultrasound guidance aids in the probe placement so what's why is hydro dissection so important well prior to starting on placement of a probe until under ct or an ultrasound guidance such such fluid is actually instilled within the the extend extended margins of the tumor what it does is it ensures that the ablation margin does not extend beyond the tumor margins which is already marked by hydro dissection prior to initiation of the procedure there has been evidence which states retrograde chilled infusion via ureteral catheter or an integrated infusion of normal saline via nephrostomy which is done in conjunction of a urologist helps protects the ureters there has been usage of fiducial electromagnetic skin markers which actually aid in probe placement so the theme here is the sequential ablation is to which goes on to which goes on to advocate to uh, deep first deep first but what i mean by deep first is you actually ablate the deep part of the tumor first what that does is actually causes infarction within the renal tissue or in as a matter of fact the tumor tissue it's important to understand the end organ supply idiosyncrasies limited to the kidney it's well understood that renal frequency or an rfa is not limited to treatment of renal cell carcinoma it's also used nowadays for hepatocellular carcinoma and liver having a dual blood supply does not lead to infarction 
Meanwhile, the same cannot be said about kidney. Hence, the deep first causes an infarction within the kidney and leads to this ablation process to proceed normally, leading to ischemia and damage. The complication. Complication spores RFA include infection, which are usually deal by administering prophylactic antibiotics. Tumor seeding along the probe track can be managed by ablating the track, which you will be seeing shortly. Hemorrhage is a complication, but there is a bright side to it. Treatment of life-threatening and transfusion-dependent hematuria and also for hemorrhage after partial, partial nephrectomy is treated by RFA. Abscesses have been reported post-ablation and it's important to differentiate them from tumor recurrence on CT imaging. So here is a system from Medtronics with multi-tined probes and from Metastar which has been patented in US with a single tined probe. So here is a little bit about how radio frequency ablation takes place. So the most inferior slice just shows the small renal tumor just on the bottom left of the screen there. Okay. So we know that's a slice, we're just going to make a mark on the skin. It's going to be pressing onto your skin now. And that's where we're going to be putting our local anesthetic. So we're just going to put some more local anaesthetic in now. So just using a slightly longer needle, aiming along the same trajectory that we're going to be doing our ablation along. Just going to check our position. Take a small breath in now, hold it there. Okay, so that looks right on target. I'm just going to make a small nick. needles, the short 10 centimeter needle which should be long enough to get to the relatively superficial lesion of the brain. It has a 3 centimeter ablation tip. So these are the connection tubings for irrigation to keep the tip of the needle cool. It's a closed circuit so this doesn't actually come into the contact with the patient. Tubing being put through the pump. Connected to a cold bag of saline. Very simple machine now, which. This is the negative feedback loop that I was talking about. Standard ablation. And the machine pretty much does the rest for us. And we select the electrode and the time is set to 12 minutes. Right, so we're just going to position our needle now into the lesion. Okay, take a breath in for me, hold it there, and breathe away. Okay, so that we need to be able to slightly more towards the feet. Breathe away. Okay, so we're virtually into the lesion there, so we just need to go another centimetre or so, and we'll be in it, providing we get the same level of inspiration for this. drop down from the 37 degrees for the patient. Of course now all the fluid is pumping through. Let's drop the temperature right down. So once the system is primed, all the air is out of the system, the ablation will start automatically. Now the ablation is set for 12 minutes at the moment, but I suspect given the size of this region, 12 minutes will 
uh, be too long and we'll be able to cut the relation down to about six or seven minutes. The relation started now, you can see it's 58, 59 watts at the moment. The impedance 73 ohms. As the impedance goes up, the power will drop off and then it'll cycle and then start ramping up the power again. So the pump's turned off now, the ablation's finished, five and a half minutes, you can see the temperature's reached at least 81 degrees, which is a good ablation. So we're now going to do track ablation to make sure we don't get any seeding along the track. So we select the electrode again, and it's set to 85 degrees as the target, and the machine will adjust the power accordingly as I slowly withdraw the needle. So I'm just going to press start, and I'm just going to slowly withdraw the needle now. And it's quite superficial, so we're just going to stop the ablation there. And that's just finished. Okay. So moving on to the next frontier in the treat in the treatment challenges for RCC with minimally invasive techniques, cryoabulation. So, cruos is Greek for frost and are not at L and is, or are not and his colleagues uh, used ice salt mixtures for treatment of breast and cervical cancers in the early 19th, 19th century in London. What it does is it actually causes cytolysis by form formation of extracellular and intracellular ice crystal formation. The intracellular dehydration which ensures and the pH changes causes ischemic necrosis via vascular insult. Cryoactivation of anti-tumor immune responses along with the endothelial damage leads to platelet degradation and microthrombi formation which ultimately leads to the apoptosis of the tumor cells. So, how to make the procedure more efficient? Well, the tissue is subjected to a temperature of less than of minus 40 degrees centigrade, around 40 degrees below the freezing point of water for the duration of 3 minutes. The velocity of cooling, the nadir temperature, freezing duration, velocity of thawing, and the number of freeze-thaw cycles make the procedure more efficient. Presence of otherwise large blood vessels causes heat sink effect that I have already mentioned earlier with respect to RFA. Renal tissues need an exposure to or below minus 19.4 degrees centigrade. It's important to understand that direct puncture into the collecting system with the cryo probe. The collecting system actually goes on to heal without leading to urinary fistulas. While similar cannot be said about RFA, where urinary fistulas post probe placement is a common complication. So here's a device used for cryoabulation by Cryptoconus. So the intricacies involved in the procedure. Well, the procedure systems come in different different variations and by different companies. The three patented systems, namely Endocare, Galil Medical and Ankura, use an ultrasound or a CT guided access and use argon gas for ablation. So now there has been advocacy of laparoscopic renal cryoablation versus the ultrasound or a CT guided CRA because it offers the advantage of precise cryoprobe positioning and monitoring of the ice ball under real-time ultrasound and as well as direct vision. So here is a vision of how one of the system, namely Endocare works. You can visualize the different girths or different thickness of probes that are placed and the ice ball effect that actually surrounds the probe. It's important to see 
that the tissues actually go on from 40 degrees from inside to at least a zero degree to the outside. The depth of the probe also determines the, the effectiveness of cryoablation. So, a little thermodynamics into effect and into picture for cryoablation is actually to go on and understand the Joule-Thomson effect. So what is Joule-Thomson effect? Well, it actually deals with the temperature change of a real gas or a liquid when it is actually forced through a valve or a porous plug while keeping it insulated so that no heat is exchanged with the environment. This procedure is actually called a throttling process or a Joule-Thomson process. Say for an argon gas which is used in CRA, it exists as a gas at room temperature pressure, but as the temperature goes down, it forms a liquid. So in, in, in complete contrast to the two states, if you actually go on to increase the pressure with respect to the Joule-Thomson coefficient, keeping it more than zero, the given gas behaves like a supercritical matter or a supercritical substance which actually has a property to sustain and retain the temperature which is way beyond the freezing point and hence causing an effective cryoabulation. So here's an example is of how laparoscopically assisted CRA is done. A third generation cryoablation machine in our practice uses argon gas for freezing and helium gas for active thawing, allowing for the use of ultra thin 17 gauge cryoprobe needles. The cryosurgical site is characterized by two zones a central zone where cellular death occurs due to a direct ice injury, leading to coagulative and osmotic necrosis and a peripheric zone characterized by varying degrees of injury and indirect cell death, mainly due to thrombosis and apoptosis. Under general anesthesia, the patient is placed in plank position at a 30 degree angle with lower leg flex and upper leg extended. There is no need to flex the table at this point. Surgical cushion must be placed on the patient's back to guarantee the position during the procedure. Foam is applied to points of contact between the patient and the surgical table to prevent positioning injuries. Straps must be applied onto the patient's pelvis, thoraces, and legs for safety. A varus needle is placed in the upper quadrant and pneumoperitoneum is achieved. For posterior tumors, one 5 mm trocar is placed 3 cm above umbilicus for a 0 degree deflectible tip endo eye camera. The other trocars are placed in the abdominal wall, observing a 90 degree angle among them. For all anterior tumors, a laparoscopic single site device is inserted through a single paraumbilical incision. The white cold line is taken down, avoiding large dissection. Visceral rotation of the colon is performed, and the tumor region is the only one to be carefully dissected. A laparoscopic ultrasound probe is inserted for identification of the renal tumor boundaries. After that, size and depth are measured. Gerota's fascia is open exclusively at that site and the tumor is exposed. Fat surrounding the tumor is collected and sent for pathology. Ultrasound is used prior to the insertion of the needles to determine the exact location and size of the tumor. An initial 1.7 millimeter cryoprobe is transcutaneously inserted into the abdomen and then into the mass. The probe is anchored into the tumor by 1 to 2 millimeters of freezing. Additional probes are placed around the first probe depending on the tumor size to ensure freezing of the entire mass. As seen in the image of 
right, triangulation of two additional probes around the first probe ensures active formation of the ice ball with proper surgical margin. Two freezing and active thawing cycles are performed and continuously monitored by real-time laparoscopic ultrasonography. Renal mass biopsy is performed using a biopsy needle between the first and second freezing cycle. At the end of the procedure, flow seal is applied to the biopsy site to prevent further bleeding and Gerota's fascia is closed. The patient is usually discharged within 24 hours. A follow-up consultation is scheduled after two weeks to check the results of the pathology. The patient is encouraged to return annually. So, moving on to the recent review articles in peer-reviewed journals with respect to CRA for treatment of sporadic renal cell carcinoma. This study includes 3 to 5 year outcomes in 220 patients with biopsy proven RCC. What's important to note here is the metastatic free survival rate which is actually at 95% at a duration of 5 years post RFA. It's also important to note the common complications which result resulted post CRA which include pneumothorax at number 1 followed by pelvic elisial or ureteric injuries at number 4, ureteric obstruction and hematuria were labeled at 3 and 4 respectively. So here's another comparative article that goes on to compare cryoablation versus RFA for small renal masses. It, it's a meta-analysis which included 1375 kidney lesions that were either treated by CRA or RFA. So no differences were detected. Pre-treatment biopsy for cryobilated lesions was performed more at a percentage of 82.3 versus RFA than at, that was at 62.2. Repeat ablation post-procedure was more common for RFA at 8.5% versus 1.3% for CRA. The rates of local tumor progression discussed here were significantly higher for RFA at 12.9% versus 5.2% for CRA. Metastasis post-procedure was reported less frequently for cryoablation at 1% versus RFA at 2.5%. Cryoablation was usually performed laparoscopically 65% of times while RFA was performed percutaneously or with via transcutaneous excess 94% of the times. So, a recently introduced modality in the treatment, in the, tre in the minimally invasive treatment of RCC includes high intensity frequency, high intensity focused ultrasound or HIFU as it's better known today. So ultrasounds are sounds which are beyond the threshold of human hearing, that is 16 kilohertz and beyond. So an alternating current is passed across a piezoelectric material such as lead zirconate. Piezo is Greek for push. Here is a diagrammatic representation of the process. While compressing the, the said material, lead zirconate titanate in the presence of voltage generates high frequency ultrasounds which actually leads to 
an oscillation of the tissue at the same frequency as of the as of the alternating current current that is producing the ultrasound and the waves that are produced are actually penetrable through the tissue so what's different ab about this ultrasound as compared to the diagnostic ultrasounds that we are more common and in, in routine routinely used while diagnosing our patients in the clinic and day to day use well the diagnostic ultrasound has a frequency range in in ranges of 1 in to 20 megahertz versus the therapeutic hifu which is in ranges of frequency of 0.8 to 3.5 megahertz it's quite high of high intensity focuses 5 watts of power across a centimeter square of tumor tissue though it produces an ablative zone which is comparable to a grain of rice it's barely 1 into 3 millimeter transverse and 8 into 15 millimeter across the beam axis the conversion of mechanical in energy into heat energy raises the temperature of the tumor tissues to an eight de to a temperature of 80 degrees centigrade and causes inertial cavitation and how does the concept of inertial cavitation comes here for that you need to have a little bit of physics recall from the past while an oscillating object produces a longitudinal sound wave it propagates the sound via compression and rarefactions where a compression is a more dense area of a substance as compared to rarefaction which is a less denser area so what happens is that the gas from the rarefaction area actually escapes and forms bubbles into the when it escapes into the compressed area or the compression area so the sequel of the entire ablation process via hifu is via inertial cavitation which actually causes alternating cycles of compression and rarefactions the rarefaction as i mentioned earlier causes the gas to draw out from the tumor tissue in the rarefaction and form bubbles in compressions which then collapsed rapidly. The mechanical stress which follows causes a degree of thermal injury which itself induces cell necrosis. Histologically, the tissues resemble homogeneous coagulative necrosis which actually leads to inflammatory responses, formation of granulation tissue resulting in a scar. The heat sink effect also kicks in while treating cystic lesion and as far as as far as calcified lesions are concerned there is an in, there is reverberation of the frequency and high frequency ultrasound waves and hence shielding of the tumor resulting in inefficient inefficiency of the process itself so here's a transducer of hifu focused transcutaneously on top of a tumor and targeting the tumor tissue within the native renal tissue. So these are the references for today's journal club. I thank you all for joining me here today. Thank you.